everyone. Whoop, whoop. Welcome to Too Legit to QT, where you can. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Where you can get it done with Tish and be on your come up with me, Koya. Hey, everyone. We are so excited because today we have the one, the only, Stefan Bristol, who is the writer and director of See You Yesterday on Netflix. We are so excited. Welcome to the show, Stefan. Thank you for, for having me. I'm humbled. I'm very, very lucky to uh, be talking to such two gorgeous women. Aww. You sound humble. He got the humble voice on, right? Like I'm trying. I'm trying like to get my. I'm Denzel, I'm, and I yeah. just keep sweat. Yeah. Like, keep sweat. Like, w. Yeah. Key sweat. <laughs> you totally got the teeth, teeth, the key sweat thing going on right now with the voice. You know, let me lower my voice for the ladies out there. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Well, guys, t uh, today we're here to talk opportunity readiness with Stefan. And I'm just super juiced because I feel like we literally preach create your own opportunity, create your own opportunity. And you are the epitome of creating your own opportunity. You mm. turned your 17 minute thesis into the feature film on Netflix, See You Yesterday. And I mean, you're like living proof that if you can believe it, you can achieve it. So, um, like, can you tell us a little bit about your process and just how that even came to be? Well, can we, can we, oh. one second, one second. I want to wish our sponsor, Kenny, from oh. um, Blue Lizard Bar and Grill, a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Kenny, out there. And we thank our sponsors, of course, Blue Lizard Bar and Grill and Desserts. Happy birthday. Yes. First and foremost, support black businesses. Yes. Local businesses, please, because this is a hard time for local and black businesses. So if you guys are out there, support, support your local business dash entrepreneur. Yes. And Kenny has a new deck that he's creating. You can see it on Instagram. He's not playing. He doesn't care about it. Shut down. He don't care. He yeah. doesn't sing. Opportunity ready. He was ready. Yep. <laughs> Always ready. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So we don't want to um, ignore our sponsors. So yes. Happy birthday, Kenny. We love you. We thank you so much for your love and your support. Stefan, can you yes. tell the people what your process was and just, I mean, it was a 17 minute thesis and it blew up. Tell it, can you tell us a little bit about that? You just asked me to explain five years in one question. Mm. It took me five years to make that film on Netflix mm -hmm. right now. It was a, it was extraneous journey. Um, a lot of, t a lot of crying. A lot of uh, hard work went into it. It was, you know, it's, it was not a small feat. Um, I made a 17-minute film for my thesis film at NYU Graduate Film School, and <laughs> and, um, and I was trying to make a feature film first to graduate as my uh, my thesis, but my professors said I was delusional <laughs> because I wasn't ready to be a feature film director yet. And I had to uh, make another short film to really get my my bearings in order. And you know there was failures with the short film. You know I had uh, two producers who weren't great. I had to fire them mm. in the midst Ooh. of trying to get it off. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't blame the whole process entirely on them, but as when you know I have to blame myself for hiring them. Um, and. But I, you know, I cried for a week. I asked my mother for rent, uh, and, and then but she turned around and refinanced her home and uh, gave gave me money for short film, um, mm. and and um, I had to reteam everybody. I had to find a co-writer to help me with the script, um, and then we shoot the short film. Um, and then you know, Spike Lee, my longtime mentor. Uh, came to me, said, "Hey, Steph, I want to be your producer. I know there's, um, you know, some some folks 
who was already attached to produce, but I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Think about it. I said, ain't no time to think about it, motherfucker. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, we sent, we had the short film go out to um, about as many film festivals as possible around the world. Uh, end up being 35 film festivals, I think a little bit more. And the biggest film festival that helped, come, some of the big film festivals that helped us um, get, and it's not Sundance, it's not Slam Dance, not Tribeca, not South by Southwest. Uh, it was American Black Film Festival. That was the one yes. that, that really helped us out. And then you got Black Star Film Festival, and then you got Milwaukee uh, Film Festival, and 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 um, uh, Pan African Film Festival. These are the film festivals that really uh, helped me out and get notoriety. And and, and Martha's Vineyard. Mm. African American Film Festival, where I won the HBO Short Film Award, and um, and uh, during during these festivals, we thought just tell people like, "Yo, we're making a feature off this film," and it does it did well. And we got accolades, we got an audience, people were excited about it, and and uh, me and Frederica, we started writing the script script again during this process, um, and then when we felt the the uh, writing was in a good place, we Spike flew me out to LA and I met, you know, I'm, I've been in rooms I never imagined I'll be in, you know, some of the top Hollywood execs, you know what I'm saying? And, and I felt like I made it, but I was still broke. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I was in Hollywood, you know what I'm saying? And that's how I also got my, um, uh, my, uh, my agent as well. You know, I was, um, I would, you know, black woman too, Andrea Nelson Meeks, legend in the business. Oh. And and she was at ICM Partners, and it was crazy. You know, you walk into that. I, I really felt like I was Hollywood. I walked into that place. It was in the top floor somewhere. You saw a beautiful view of LA, the valley, and everything. And then they had a, a swimming pool, a basketball court, a, 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 a airstrip, everything. I was. It was. It was nuts, man. And um, and um, and and they welcomed me. Um, she welcomed me with open arms. Uh, and and you know we met with Netflix and that meeting went well and then um, and then we put a pause on the pitching because what what's special about this journey is that Spike invited me uh, me and another um, young woman um, to be his personal assistants on Black Klansman. Black Klansman, the legendary film Black Klansman. I was his assistant and mostly my like. My, the other sister, Lauren Owen, she was Spike. She did most of the hard work. I was just, I was just shadowing Spike. I was on, you know, I, I was writing Spike's Kurt Tales to see, you know, right behind him, trying to see how he was directing every day, and you know, uh, I, I was observing how he was talking to the DP Chase Irving. I was observing how he was uh, directing uh, John David Washington, uh, Laura Harrier, and and Adam Driver. It was like I was very close, you know. You know, I, I was so close I could I could smell the farts. That's how close I was to, to the actors because I want to know exactly what this man was saying to them. And that process was helpful because that helped me be prepared for, to direct my own feature film. I was that was the first time I was on a real Hollywood set. And if I didn't have that experience, I, I would have not been prepared to uh, to direct my feature. And and after that, you know, we you know Spike let me know we got to deal with Netflix and. Um, and yeah, we shot, you know, we continue to write the film and I was broke. All this during this, all this time, these five years, I was extremely broke. And it was so bad um, that, you know, even Spike, God, God bless him, was able to give me uh, a loan um, to live off of. It was bad. And there was a lot of crying and everything, man. I had a close circle of mine to talk to and whatnot. And I'm dragging it because I know there's more questions, but, um, <laughs> It's okay. Speak your truth. Yeah, Speak your truth. yeah, yeah, man. It was, I'm it was happy. Nice. That, I'm happy that you talk. That you're talking about the process and your financial process because we've talked about this before how nobody wants to talk about that in the business they see the lights they see the glamour they see that you're on tv or you're working with with x y and z but i think it was taraji p henson who said like 
nobody knows when you leave set and you're going home and you're eating top ramen. You know, there's mm -hmm. just this like false notion true. that. Um, it's true. And we talk about that too, Bestie. Like Me um, too. Me people too. who have fame but no money, and and it's it's very common mm -hmm. in the entertainment industry. So I thank you for your transparency. But you want to know what? Another thing is, is like, like I do like job after job after job, and I meet all kinds. Like you know, um, you know Andy Fickman, who's come on the show. He's my mentor, and mm -hmm. you know he's helped me throughout my career. And I go from project to project to project. But the struggle is real, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the struggle, the struggle is real. Um, and I'm a line producer, so I manage. Mm -hmm. I manage money. And I'm, and it's still mm -hmm. struggle is real, you know? So I think, you know, there's this misconception that just because you're around all these people, but that somehow that translates to like some sort of financial gain. Mm -hmm. And I know all these celebrities and they just like, you know, they're working, uh, not to say that I'm like not, not somebody special because I feel like I'm special, but we, we all are working together to get yep. to a certain space. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that. We all are working together to get to a, cer a certain space. And it's just really interesting because um, one of the things that we always talk about or I talk to people about is diversifying, right? So that when you're in this space as an entrepreneur artist, that you have something to go off of because, you know, t almost nearly 10 years in this you know, I know Dark Oye, you've been doing this since you've been like five, but, but nearly nearly 10, 10 years in this, 10, 12 years in this game, man, it, it's, it's no joke. Mm -hmm. You know, the money situation is no joke. And, you know, I do believe that, um, you know, creativity is limitless. I always, I say that to you all the time, but the reality is <laughs> we are creative we love what it is that we're doing, but life goes on whether or not we make it or not. And that's the exactly. thing people don't, they don't see, like, we still got life. And run me my money. Like at the end of the day, I'm sorry, run me my money. Like my dad always says, all that glitter isn't gold. And I'm sorry, but I'm not going to get caught up in smoke and mirrors. And mm -hmm. what I heard you say, Stefan, earlier is I heard you talk about your support system, your support system with your mom, your support system with, um, with Spike Lee. And a lot of times you don't see the other moving parts that are holding up this mm -hmm. movie. And you see it a lot with different different celebrities, different um, entrepreneurs. There is some, something and usually somebody or a group of people behind the scenes that are holding that person down. And um, it's just so interesting because I, I know Spike Lee is your mentor, but I mean, it seems like he re you guys really have a special relationship. Like how, how did you meet? And then, and, and how did you like grow that relationship to where he he wants to see you succeed and win? Because sometimes you can have a mentor, and I've had like mentors where they're like, okay, I'll tell you this and that, but I'm not gonna really help you. I'll, I'll give you information, but I'm not really gonna help you. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful place, in the United States of America, where it's, it's a great place to learn how to be and just to be. A black man. That's Morehouse College, baby. Morehouse <laughs> hey, College. There you go. There you the, go. The, the best HBCU. I would say no. It's the second best HBCU in the country. The first best is Spelman College. Shout out to my. There Spelman we go. College. Shout out to Spelman. Shout you know, out so, to Spelman. And I met. I was um, at Morehouse under, undergrad, and I. Um, I woke up one morning because I was trying to be a filmmaker for such a long time. I was discouraged to do it. But I woke up one morning and said, fuck it, I'm gonna be this is what I want to do for my life. And I just go around campus trying to figure it out, trying to trying to change my major, and that didn't work out because the major ended in 1996 uh, for filmmaking. And then, you know, I just teamed up with a, um, a lot of students at Clark Atlanta University and came up with some some friends of mine at college um, that was into filmmaking and um, you know, some noble names would be like, you know, Tariq Jackson, God rest his soul, rising mm -hmm. star is a good friend of mine at Morehouse. Um, Stephen Love, who's a, now is a huge producer in Hollywood right now. And 
during this time, I was just making films and, and a professor, um, um, you know, uh, Mr. Ron Thomas, uh, he said, you know, Stefan, you know, Spike is gonna do a, um, a, a screening at, at King's Chapel of Kobe doing work. Mm. You should go there and meet Spike. I was like, okay, cool. And I went there and saw the film and Spike Lee, I was like, oh my God, Spike Lee, ooh, ooh. And, um, and I went out to him after the screening, I said, Spike, man, I would love to, uh, uh, I would love to have an internship with you at 40 Acres because I live in New York. At the time I lived in Long Island. Um, he, and he said, all right, he, you know, here's my email, so send me your resume. Send it and I haven't heard anything from him. Uh, next semester, that was a fall semester. Uh, the spring of the spring of fall, well, one of the semesters. The next semester, I went over to uh, Clark Atlanta University where he was showing a short film. Uh, Jesus Children of America, and I rushed up to Spike afterwards. Said Spike, remember me? Nah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> do you mind if I have an internship at Forty Acres? Here's my email. Send me your resume. Haven't heard shit. Uh, next semester, <laughs> I, me and my my Morehouse brothers was trying to start a uh, film program at Morehouse College at the time. Um, led by uh, uh, Stephen Love, uh, we call him Dr. Love. Um, and we met with the Dean, um, uh, Dean Mills and Spike came in. So, and we was all trying to pitch to him uh, to help us with the program. And there he saw one of my short films that I did uh, at Morehouse um, through uh, Campus Movie Fest. And he saw that and he liked it and whatnot. And after the meeting, he gets up and he tried to rush out and I rushed right behind. I was like, Spike! My third time asking for an internship. Hook a brother up. <laughs> third time, huh? I said, yes, sir, third time. Okay, here's my email. Send me a, send me a resume. I said, this one. <laughs> I was so pissed. <laughs> oh, God. And But uh, luckily, a week later, I got an um, email from his office saying I got an internship at 40 Acres for a mule for the summer. And... I worked my ass off in that internship. Mm. I was on Long Island, lived on Long Island, and I had to go uh, to Brooklyn five days a week with no money. And then on the weekends, I had to work on a regular job to mm. earn money. This is not paid. And I did that for the whole motherfucking summer. Mm. And, and two interns at that office was fired. I survived. <laughs> <laughs> this is 2010. This oh shit is 10 years ago. Mm. And um and Jesus 10 years ago. Wow, God, crazy. Wow. Uh wow. and uh <laughs> and then I and then um I asked him for a letter of, letter of recommendation for NYU and he and, did, and I and he gave it to me. He said just write the letter and I signed it and I did that. Signed it. And um um and I worked my ass off on Trying to get to NYU, got to NYU. Grace, I got, I got into NYU, USC, NYU, Singapore, and Sky. I got all four colleges mm. for graduate school, and I chose the best one, NYU. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, when I was in my first in my first year, I asked him, "Hey, Spike, you know, I want you to be my mentor." He said, "Yeah, I got you." And the rest is history. Mm. Oh. But you were very persistent. Like, I mean, I, I think sometimes some people, maybe they don't want, they're a little bit apprehensive with being pushy, you know? Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of people I've talked to you about that, Tish, you know, like how to be persistent. Um, we've even gotten the, um, we've even gotten the question. Oh, Let me tell you something, white folks do that all the time, be pushy and, and, and be persistent. <laughs> Why can't we? No. I put that out there. And, it got, and, it, and it helped them out like a motherfucker. But you you know what I want to say about that too, Stefan? Um, it's it's very interesting because like in Hollywood, you have these perceptions that are like you're gonna be like Jennifer Lawrence, where you someone just met you on the street and they're just gonna give you an opportunity and they're just gonna put you in their film and take a picture of you and it's just going to happen. And it's such a false 
it's such a false narrative, but it's the way that I think it's the way that the industry thought it, it thrives off of this, off the dream, you know, not off of like people actually making money or creating films. It's like, it's like they take the dream and they put it in their hands and they just hold it tingling in front of your face. Like, this is Hollywood, you can make it one day. And then, but it's so hard. It is so hard. Like people really truly don't understand the amount of people that you have to get to know and get. And it's hard because they have gatekeepers for the gatekeepers for the gatekeepers, you know? Mm -hmm. So the reason why, like it took Spike Lee probably three times is because he has a gatekeeper for the gatekeeper for the gatekeeper, probably at his company. It's like, ah, it's him again. Ah, okay, ah, whatever, you know? And it probably took him to say, you know what? Did you guys see that resume from that kid? Like who emailed me, he said he emailed me two, three times. I don't know, I'm not getting it. Oh yeah, well, also, even to see his tenacity, like if somebody has reached out to you three times and literally will be at an event and be so vulnerable to say, hey, hook a brother up. It's just like, at least if I saw that, I would say, you know what? There's something about that person that is consistent and that won't give up. Do you know what I mean? He's not gonna, I, I'm gonna tell you this, right? Like as a person who like does like a thousand auditions, like I go through a, a thousand auditions or whatever, right? Sometimes when I even get emails, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, like it's not, sometimes it's not even like about like that person. It's just about like, like I'm busy with this, you know? So like, I won't even remember that I talked to you because I'm busy with this. Right. Mm -hmm. So probably with him is he probably was doing a couple things, you know, and then finally he probably got a little less busy. busy and he, he knew like, who I was. <laughs> he knew. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, because you ain't somebody. <laughs> he, he, I know he kept, he kept, uh, he kept going at it, man. He kept going at it, but that's what it takes. Cause sometimes that's just all it takes persistence man and, but and he also said that he worked his behind off and he like showed him i am worthy because i also feel like like how do you get and keep an industry mentor you know like that that's a thing within itself he said that he fired like two different people and spike lee is a perfectionist like i don't know like i i mean i see his work you have to be a genius you have to be a perfectionist to produce that level of work and I mean, you said that you showed up every day and you and you showed out. I mean, so along the lines of that, right, showing up every day, showing out, doing this, what are some of the, let's say, technical, um, yeah, what are some of like the technical and personal skills that you learned from working with, you know, and point blank, what have you learned in the last 10 years? Let's even go there, technical and personal skills. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> like 10 years. That's, that's well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, Jesus Christ. I mean, that's have you learned a lot of light? Have you learned to pick up a camera? Have you learned to- I mean, No, I mean, because of, because of film school, yeah. I mean, I learned my craft. I mean, talking about craft now, I learned like, I mean, I kind of have agree with it, you know it's all about knowing who you know and whatnot. But you can know any everybody and their mother in Hollywood. But if you don't have talent, then motherfuckers ain't gonna hide. Mm. And that's so one. If and you, so if and you even were on set, if you were on the set, right, and somebody was yeah. like, "Ah, oh, I can't put this light up," you think you can help them? <laughs> Could you help them? Could no. you be like, you know, no? Okay. No, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not. No. No, you I'm, ain't. I'm that. direct. I'm this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Somebody else help them out. But you could probably you could probably cut a page or two. I could probably do that. Yeah, you <laughs> there you go. Like that's a skill. Well, that's so hard. hard. That's hard. But, step, tell me this, Stefan. You went through a lot of obstacles. I mean, we literally heard how you were broke and you know you but you you never you never gave up like how did you stay in the mindset to keep going like when you were sitting up there in your room with no money broke but you still had this dream that you were pursuing how did you stay motivated jesus 
I'm telling you right straight up. I I I I am believer of the Lord. Mm. I have faith. Your faith is green as a mustard seed. And I had a vision. I had a vision. I believe in myself. That's what, that's another hard thing. Is believing yourself. That's that's, that's crazy. Uh, a lot of people under, underestimate that. Believe mm. in yourself. When you believe in yourself, you can actually do it. Um, you know, I family members, friends, whatever doubt that I can get this far. Mm. Doubt it, and those doubts were planting in your head. Those doubts was real. Those times where I am lonely, you know, crying with, to my friends on the phone, um, in bed with, with only what a couple of uh, hundred dollars in the bank account, sometimes less, sometimes it's overdrawn. Uh, I just believed that in the dream. Man. I, I knew I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew exactly what I wanted to say with the film. And I believed that from I see the vision clear as motherfucking day. It was like, it was burning clear. Okay. And I knew I can do it. The, the hardest part was convincing everybody else. That's right. the that's the journey, and, and it it was so it was like I I see the vision clear as day, and I know what I'm capable of doing. That anybody who denied me of it, I was insulted. Mm. Mm. That's and so interesting. A, that's really interesting that you're saying that because um, I you know it it I just kind of feel like it has to be like your tribe because when you have the right tribe, man, you just thrive. Yeah, you just yeah, was, drive. It's just the people who are for you who are for you, point blank. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I I see it all the time. It's just like you might have it, like even a great idea, man. And I see people, all these creative people, but it just takes. My husband always says it only takes one person, one person, just mm -hmm. one, and that's just that's just what it is. Yeah, that's really yeah. Cool, you know. Yeah, yeah. The, one person. You, you need. There's, there's always going to be people. This. That's how it's hard to decipher people um, who don't who don't believe you, but still want to work with you. It's mm. easy to decipher. Mm -hmm. but they, they don't, but they still want. Well, still want to work with you because to say just in case, I want to say that I'm the one. I was there. Mm -hmm. You want to get rid of those people quickly. Um, but if you find people that believes in you, you know, hang on to them like a motherfucker. And, and, it's crazy. and it's crazy. And it's how, crazy. I still have people that don't believe me right now. How 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 do you decipher between those people? Because I think that's the thing. Like mm -hmm. when you, it's one thing to not really have a body of work um, mm -hmm. and whatnot. But you're in a position where you've created this body of work. You have these people that you're connected with. How do you sift? How do you sift through people to know if that individual who wants to work with you is for you, and if they're not? Uh, by the fruits of their labor. Are they doing enough? Are they doing enough? Are they fighting for you? Mm. And how about if they That's stick around? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. can we say that? Like when you're going through, and that's yeah. just a common thing. Like I see it all the time out there. Where it's all good and dandy when you're when you're you know when everybody's talking about how great you are, but then when the buzz goes down, like are you going to be around? Yeah, right. you're going to be around until I. Are you going to wait for me to get the next thing? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be around? Are you going to, you know, be in the space, and also be in the same mindset of, to continue to thrive? I mean, that has to that has to. Uh, you can just tell by the energy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. By the way, like if there are going to be days that it just feel like the train is not moving, it's just going to be that just doesn't feel right. And they're there to like really uplift you. You know what I'm saying? But if they be condescending, if they don't really, you know, do much or they don't have that energy, the air about them, like they're that they really have your back, mm. they'll get rid of them quickly. Because mm. so you don't want people there that's lukewarm. You know what I'm saying? Spike wasn't yeah. lukewarm. Rodrigo wasn't lukewarm. You know mm. what I'm saying? Um, folks at Netflix, thank God, wasn't lukewarm. Mm. How so, did you meet Rodrigo, um, your writing partner, anyway? Oh, I met her at uh, NYU. I was trying when I, after I fired my producers, I went to. Um, I needed to do more work on the script, and I just learned that I need a co-writer to help me, you know, really get it tight. Um, and 
I went to the, the dramatic, I wanted to make sure that whoever I partnered with co-writing, they're not also directors. Because in the program, um, uh, I was in the graduate film program, it's all directors. And, and if anybody want to collaborate with each other, we'll write with each other. And I don't want no, another motherfucking director to write with me. Uh, so when the dramatic writing department, where they teach you um, playwright and screenwriting, um, and the actor chair there, I said, please look at, you know, this is my project I'm working on. Do you know anybody um, that would, uh, that, do you know anybody that was interested in this? And Fajika was on the list of folks, and she was the only black woman on the list. Mm. Mm. So, and, and I, you know, interviewed everybody, everybody. And she was, she was the best writer on the list. And she was just, and she was cool people. And I, um, now, now she's like a sister to me. Um, she's a very good dear friend. And, um, and I needed, and I'm, I'm lucky because I needed a black woman to do this picture. Mm, there you go. So in the, uh, with that, transitioning to this question. So how do you stay with that? Because to me, that sounds like you jumped into like an opportunity. How do you stay opportunity ready? Because a little bit of what you're saying, it's kind of like you being opportunity ready, but mm -hmm. how do you keep yourself being opportunity ready? Um. I try to think 10 steps ahead and trying to gather everything that I need um, as fast as possible. Uh, I knew that I, from my mistakes, I knew what I need before launch. So, okay, I, I just make a list. I need this, I need that, I need these people. And um, and I schedule and work hard on it. And I make sacrifices, you know, during that time. I, it would have been beneficial if I had a full-time job. But if I knew, if I took a full-time job, I would have never been able to um, to fully focus on my work. So I had to make sacrifices doing only part-time work and and just skim by whenever I can. It was that, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is there like, um, you know, is there a, mm -hmm. like a set type, I, I wouldn't even say that, like process that you have? Do you have your like your own creative process when it comes to you like being ready as a director? Uh, what, um, watch movies, for sure. Watch a lot of movies um, that pertains to the Pacific project. Um, right, you know, we're getting up to make mo uh, another movie right now. I have to like really go back to uh, learn how to direct actors. So I'm gonna start taking some classes or just getting friends of mine, build on Zoom. That's the best thing we can do and and, 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 and just learn how to direct. Um, so for me to be ready is to really continue to uh, practice my craft as much as possible. Mm. Very important, very, very important. So you are like a- Very, you're, very important. So you, are you, you, do you deem yourself as like a, um, or would you consider yourself a, a constant student? Mm. I have no idea because I'm constantly working and not getting paid. <laughs> so I don't even know. The student phase is over. Oh God! Dude, I just, I just like, oh, I need, a, I gotta brush my skills on this, and I just, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, because I'm always learning about something every day. You know, dealing with Hollywood execs and everything. I'm learning something new every day. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your ego out of it? Because we talked to uh, John Cry, um, <laughs> uh, who used to be head of, head of de development for New Market, New Market Films. Yeah, and he said that you know, in this business, you just have to take your ego out of everything because your ego will make you do things that you never thought that you would do. It will stop you from forming alliances that you really need. Um, and he was like, you got it. You can't have an ego if you want to thrive in this business. How do you take your ego out of it? Uh, I don't take my, I don't take my ego out of it. My ego is me. And, and if I had no ego, I wouldn't even have the tenacity to do what I need to do and said, you know, I don't give a fuck what that motherfucker says about my work. Mm -hmm. I know what's right and I'm going to continue to do it. And I'm going to fight for it. And that comes through a little bit from my ego. Um, mm -hmm. It's more about managing your ego and being, you know, when to use it and when not to use it. Mm 
Hmm. But is that ego or is that just like, because we we talked about this a little bit, Bestie, where you're very like, you and I, we're both very particular about Hmm. our work. You know, like even with our with our podcast, we're very particular about how we set things up, and mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of different from having an ego because you have to have somewhat of a creative standard for yourself, right? Like right, that right. stand out, and I think that's different because I was I was um hmm. I think I was talking to Daryl. Daryl was on the show a couple. Daryl Scott mm-hmm. was on the show a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me about the writer of Lovecraft. And he said, you know, he was like, she's very particular about her show, but she's a fantastic person. Mm-hmm. And I was like, there's nothing wrong with that. She's very particular yeah. about her creativity. And I think there's a difference. Yeah, I think maybe, yeah, maybe that's been confused as ego sometimes. Yeah, I think that's a especially, difference. especially, especially if it's towards a black woman on set. Like, how do you you uniquely have your creative voice without sticking up for what it is that you believe in as a creator? I don't think that's ego. Right. That's ego. Like, you have to be able to define what makes you different, right? And when you're saying you don't care what everybody has to say about your work, that's different. That's different. Mm. Ego is, (laughs) I can tell you some egos. Can we can we get into that? I can go with that. Well, sometimes okay, so let's take it back. Because sometimes people can use people can use the same words, but they mm. don't do the same thing. That happens with me and Tish and our friendship all the time. And we'll have, <laughs> and well, yes, I'm just gonna say it, and we'll have to reel it back because what I realize is that we're saying the same words. But we don't mm. mean the same thing. So when I break down, da- when I say, okay, well, break down your definition of this, and then she'll tell me, and then I'll break down mm. my definition of that. What what I realize is that we're saying the same thing, but we don't right. mean the same thing. Um, and I think when I was asking you the question about ego, um, not, it's not necessarily like um, not what you're talking about is being passionate about your work. You know what you want, mm. and you're mm. not willing to budge. What I'm talking about is. Sometimes when you're doing a project, right? Maybe you, mm. maybe you're, you have, maybe you didn't behave in, in a certain way, or maybe there, you have certain things that you're working on, like with, within your personality. Let's talk about that. We're talking about the project that you and I did together, and there was mad egos on there. Oh, yes. Oh, we, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Then I say and, this. Then and I, no, let me tell you. I, I, I actually was like, I, I had an actress tell me, everybody wants a piece of me on a project before. Do you have that type of ego? Everybody wants a piece of me? Let no, me know. No, no, Let no, me know no, right now. That. No, that's <laughs> no, not the funny. question. Rewind this back. That's the, no, that's not the question. <laughs> the question. The question is, is that when you- Do I get jaded? Is that the question? Do I get jaded? Do I let- No, <laughs> that's not the question. Because okay. no, that's not the question. Because we're asking questions to help our viewers <laughs> they find themselves when they may find themselves in these situations. So we're not asking that because this is not get your tea. This is to help people live <laughs> their best lives so they can live their dreams and be their personal mm-hmm. best selves. So okay. what I'm saying is that we all have an ego, right? What I mean by ego is we have we have things that we're passionate about, but we have things that we're also working on, right? And sometimes mm-hmm. you have to take take out what you want sometimes for the greater good of the project, perhaps. Truth or, battles, right? Or maybe nice. or maybe you feel like you should be unapologetic. These are just examples. Maybe you feel like you should you should be unapologetic about what you want, but that necess- that won't necessarily help you to get to, to the next level or the next space. When you find yourselves in that moment where you're battling your ego, because other people watching the show may battle that part of their ego, what do you do to like keep yourself in check? It's no different than when you get in an argument with somebody and you're like, you know what, I'm strong in my convictions, but I see where they're, they're I see their point. Yeah, of view. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's just, uh, um, it was trial and error. Everything I come to right now is trial and error. And um, I was blessed enough to have uh, people in my life to tell me stuff where you have to listen to, to put yourself in the other shoes and listen to other people's um, ideas and whatnot. And, and, you know, this is a team effort. Filmmaking is a team effort. You can't do this on your own. There's no way mm-hmm. I could ever done this without Patrick. There's no way, obviously, without Spike. But I'll even go further. There's no way I could ever done this without 
my cinematographer, Felipe Verdere. There's no way I could have done this without my uh, boom operator, my what have you. It's just a team effort. And there's there's people who who, um, who are giving ideas and everything or allowing, helping you to see things that you cannot see because you're just so da 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 You're so right here. And, and you're supposed to be as a director or, or an actor um, or a producer. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, it's just remembering that like I said earlier, Tish, is, you know, we all we're all in this together. This is hard work, man. You know, you know what I'm saying? You're like, you know, you know, you're not Beyonce. Your shit, your shit stinks. <laughs> I I'm think sure her does too. No, I'm sorry, no, but no, I'm sorry. Beyonce poop glitter. Uh, <laughs> no. So Stefan, basically you were saying is that you don't have moments where you say everybody wants a piece of me. That's basically what he's saying, guys, just to put it in context. He's not on the, he's not stomping around the set being like, you can't talk to me. You got to give me yellow M&Ms, you know, in my tray and only yellow M&Ms. He's not doing none of that. That's what he's saying, y'all. So let's- Maybe maybe I've done something, you know, that shows me a little ego and and someone's watching this and stuff on his bullshit. I don't know, I I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. Have I been acting Hollywood sometimes? Hell yeah. I like, sometimes I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm this shit. Because, like, my first feature film is with Netflix. They paid me X million dollars to do it. you mm-hmm. goddamn right I felt like I, I was Hollywood, sitting on that goddamn chair, talking about I'm the director in Hollywood, now look at me. You know what I'm saying? And I wish, and I honestly wish I never did that. And I just, and I put more focus into the work. Mm. Mm-hmm. I wish I did. Uh, now I look at me, I wish I never did that. You know, saying so you know, you know how using vote mm-hmm. was break a world record. Mm-hmm. Like, imagine how better he could have been if he didn't celebrate it towards the tail end. Mm-hmm. You know what? So what? This is this is actually a good question. So if someone else is in your position, another filmmaker out there who's in your position, and Netflix comes to them, and they want to like you know get a Netflix deal, what advice would you give that filmmaker who's looking to talk to Netflix? Um, just keep in mind that Netflix might not be for you because you know every you know because what you're trying to do. You know, every, there's, there's, there, there are different um, companies have different agendas. And sometimes when those companies only meet one executive and that executive have their own agenda or mm. they have their own vision of the thing. And it just doesn't right. match with you. And, and mind you, it's not, and it's not the company. It's not like, oh, I met with someone at Netflix and Netflix is bullshit. It's not Netflix, it's just that executive. Because um, you could have been a different executive and the outcome could have been different. Mm. Just, yeah. you know, um, so just keep in mind that, you know, um, Netflix is not the crown jewel. I don't get me wrong. I'm not talking bad about Netflix at all. I, I had an amazing experience, and I'm working. Yeah. And I'm about to sign a deal with them for another film, um, and we just had a good relationship with them. But um, then there's others that haven't, and and I don't blame them for it. You know, it's just it just it just wasn't it. Not every company, not you know, not every company because Netflix is hot doesn't mean it's the best for your project. Yeah. For example, Bad Hair. It's on Hulu. It feels good for that. Yeah, it's, it's, fre- it's refreshing to see that. Mm, um, yeah. Michaela, Co- I'm not butchering her name. Michaela Cole went to Netflix with um, "I May Destroy You." For some reason, the deal wasn't great, the best for her, so she went to HBO. Mm. Mm. It's shopping. It's shopping. It's shopping. It's finding the mm-hmm. best platform for your for your project. But- That's right. I'll go ahead, Bessie. Yeah, but I what I, I guess what I'm more so wondering is is what are some of the tactics and so what are some of the things that people can actually do when they come to the table and they they oh, have sure it's have yeah. it's have a pitch ready have your pitch ready you know make sure you and your your team you can once again you cannot do this on your own make sure if you're a director have a producer a producer have make sure you have a good director and whatnot. Uh, and practice that pitch to the T. If you have a visual aid, obviously, you, you need a lookbook, obviously. Um, and you go there and, and you, you know, you, you practice your pitch often as much as you can. You go there and you and you let it rip, you know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes the first meeting is not a pitch meeting. It's a general meeting to fill, to fill you out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's remind us, a general meeting in Hollywood, Hollywood, uh, a general meeting is, is usually 
just you meet an executive or a producer or a financier mm -hmm. and they're just trying to see who you are as a person because sometimes they will have an uh, opportunity for you more than they want you to give them give them something so just be aware of that and then mm -hmm. that's and good then, yeah. And then when, when you're ready to, you know, ready to pitch and they invite you back and, okay, what's the pitch? And then, you know, you're really yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna... preparing. And it touch yeah. on, for me, I, I pitched two projects, two projects this year um, that weren't my scripts, but I had to pitch my vision to it. And each of those projects, it took me two weeks to prepare for the, for the pitch. You know, it's really interesting. And I'm glad you said that. Sometimes people like you, and maybe sometimes it's not the project because that happens where people will say, you want to know what? I really think you're what I'm looking for and not the project. And I think yeah. artists, you know, filmmakers out there, you know, it's nothing wrong with you like mm -hmm. doing something for yourself and for your own career and still doing something for your film. So I just want to put that out there mm -hmm. to our our artists dash filmmakers out there. Oh, can you guys hear me? It's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, you, you got that you got that Teddy Riley connection. That technical <laughs> difficulty. You, you, need know, to, you, need, you need to turn around until your people say, "Yo, y'all need to pay attention." <laughs> <laughs> I am the people, so who am I talking to? Myself? Well, you need to pay attention. Uh, uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to say, um, when you talked about people sometimes just wanting to work with you, um, what's the book I read? And How to Win Friends and Influence People, it talks about that, that you will make more, a lot of times people will make more money because of their personality and because they're likable and you you can call it energy. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an extrovert or an introvert, but it's who you are that and, and your ability to be able to work well with people will make you more money than just your talent or your skill alone. Um, now, if you put the two together, then you just, you set. But I think that people highly underestimate that, that you, you, you have sometimes, like you said, it's just not for you. And it's not that, it's not that Netflix or Hulu isn't great or this writer or that writer isn't wonderful, but they don't click with you. And I think it's just really, it's really valuable for our listeners to just hear that because I think, especially like when I, when we got out of grad school, we just wanted to work with everybody and anybody. And now that like we're in our thirties, we're gonna put it out there. Cause a like fine wine, um, unapologetically 30, um, you know, I just don't even care anymore. <laughs> it's like, you know, mm -hmm. if, if it's not a match, it's not a match. If it's not for me, it's just not for me. But I wish I had that in my 20s. I think that I would have sometimes when you're um, when you're just you have all of your little sensors all the way out here, you really can't be intentional and just land. I think yeah. Tish, we missed you. We miss Tish is frozen, but you really just can't land. And to the rally, yeah. I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, not so I'm, I'm about to pull out my guitar and start playing something. Uh -uh. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> we can hear I'm you. not. I'm not. I'm not. Yes. Well, now you're broken up again, bestie. So this is okay. There she go. Is it better? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's black. Clearly, yeah. you're black. Uh -huh. You're a black woman. I can. Thank you. Black. Thank you. Thank you. Ho hopefully you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. The Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I know, right? Or was it T-Mobile? Can you hear me now? Or was it T-Mobile? Can you hear no, me? No, it was it was Verizon. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Are okay. you in good hands? <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm not, oh not dealing with that um, but I just you know I just wanted to circle back because we're you know reminiscing over you know 
just advice to young filmmakers and young artists and entrepreneurs out there. You talked about um, how you would have handled things differently because you you were in a position where you got a lot of success very quickly, very soon, and you were very young mm. too. Um, you are young. I'm not saying that you are young, but um, you are very young. I think that when we talk, we talk about a lot of times when we hear opportunity ready, um, we think, oh, like, how can I have, like you said, my pitch deck together and like, you know, like for an, like a actress art, you know, a resume mm. and real and all of those things. And that's, that's the tangible part. But what advice can you give people now, no, now that you have been in that position, being opportunity ready mentally um, for opportunity as it comes? Because I think that people highly underestimate that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a work in progress, man. I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. And mm -hmm. you know, I just knew, I just know that my skill set, sorry, I believe in myself. I train hard for it for X amount of years, and it's my dream. And I just went. Because I feel like I'm ready or not, I just had to do it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, don't, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, because there's so many people out there that are underqualified for a job and then they get the job. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Barbara and was talking like, about that with women, like how um, women, um, you know, they won't apply for a job if they don't have all of the qualifications, but men, mm. they'll have three and apply. <laughs> exactly. I got it. Exactly. This. I just say when you know you're ready, it's just that you just you just when you really work and have all your ducks in a row and whatnot, and and don't try to get it's got to be get to the point when it's professional. It doesn't have to you know perfect as as much as possible, but don't try to be all too perfect. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like oh, this is perfect now I'm ready. No, it's, you know it's because after you after you're in the room and you give them your script and whatnot and you give them the pitch that. Once they hire you, they're gonna still be more work to do on the script. Mm -hmm. There's still be more work to do on the ideas and the development. I'm going through that again right now, and I know. Yeah. So it's you know, it's don't you know, don't don't try to be all too perfect. So perfection yeah. doesn't exist. That's yeah. not because Damn. not all the way all the way to the motherfucking post production. You can still yeah. be writing. I had to rewrite. You know how many times I rewrite? See yesterday during during production. <laughs> all, took all day. <laughs> Time. Yeah, I mean it's and and the thing about it is is like um, you know I hate I hate the development process because it's a never ending thing. Like the development process is always a never ending, never ending, never ending thing. I love it when we have like deadlines. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hate your, it. your camera. Oh, what's wrong with my camera? Like we it's can hear fine. you. I can, can hear her. Finish your question. You oh, oh God! I don't know why you guys can't see me. Whatever, but um, <laughs> it's a it's a, <laughs> a never-ending process. The, you you know you can change a script like a million times. Like I love when we can change a script and make a decision, because sometimes like you you know when you make a decision about the direction that this is going to go. Yes, you can improve on dialogue. Yes, you can improve the character and their journey. Um, and but sometimes, man, I'm telling you, like the creative. I love the creative process. The development process. You'll be in it for like two years. Two, three years, man. Two, three years, you'll be developing a script. And I, you know, I, I I think the development process, what I've learned is I like I like developing television because you can always like improve, improve. I hate developing film. I really mm. do. Because you gotta get to a point where you gotta make the movie. You can't always like you can't be in development for like two years for a movie, really. Then yeah. something happens like COVID and then you don't get it done. Mm. You know? I, I had a similar experience with TSA too. The, the the executive was John like, well, and we had a shoot during the during the summer because mm -hmm. the uh, lead actors are in college. And we don't want and I, I take college very seriously and, and their parents mm -hmm. do. It was a perfect place and, and and it was like well we want to do more of the script and the script was fine mm -hmm. it's, it's, never, it's never ending it's just like he, when it comes to the point where you're being nitpicky on on nonsense mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and not trust the director and not trust anybody it's like oh let's go you know it, we 
we had to really push them to like, like we just hit the ball on me. It's only so much we could do with the script. Yeah. And the thing is, and the thing is, is like the the movie is going to be re rewritten anyway in post production. There's no such thing as a perfect script. And and when you get on set, when you start working with actors, they're gonna have their input on the character. They're gonna do their character development. You might change a line or two or three or the line you thought that was the shit. You thought their line was it, right? You thought it was, and then they came in and they changed it and you're like, darn, that was better. I spent like two months coming up with that line. It Just depends. It depends. Uh, it doesn't what? always work that way. It depends. Okay, director. That wasn't huh? cute. I said, you see how he switched his waist, though, Bestie? It wasn't mm -hmm. cute. He, like, got real, like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, you know. I, I, I am from. Like, no, I'm He's like, hold <laughs> up. He's like, hold <laughs> up. Write a director here. You ain't changing my words. As he said, he's no voice. You, it was like. The There's nobody no better directing and, and writing than me. Nobody. I know. <laughs> basically, that's, basically, that's what he's saying. <laughs> Actors, if you out there changing his word, he charged you thirty dollars per word, like they do on Broadway. Thirty dollars per word, right? <laughs> his words. And just how people source, you know, if Netflix is the right film for you, or sorry, if Netflix is the right platform for you, you know, just know if you're gonna work with him, you ain't gonna be changing the script. <laughs> <laughs> Point blank. Period, point blank. You're not changing the script. Yes. And then you can decide if it's the project for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well, speaking, of, speaking of Stefan, so you, I think you talked about it a little bit earlier, but what are you currently working on right now? What's next for you? Uh, I am attached to a sci-fi thriller dystopian movie set place not too far in the future when the earth no longer has oxygen. Mm. And we follow a, um, a mother and daughter who are scientists and they have to protect their bunker from outside invaders who are trying to steal their oxygen machine. Mm. Oh. Wow. You know, you do a lot of like futuristic um, type of writing. What what films inspire you? I already know the answer, but I still want to ask it on camera. You know, the answer is to say it. Let me hear it. No, I want you to say it. No, I want you to say it. Listen. No, okay. no, 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 no. Okay, for everybody on here, um, Steph, so one of Stefan's favorite movies is Back to the Future and Jurassic Park, which inspires a lot of his work because See Yesterday was all about time travel. This is about time travel. So you're clearly uh, very passionate and obsessed with time travel. I'm not obsessed with time travel. Oh. I would, it's, it's, it's funny. Well, I appreciate time travel movies, but I would never go back in time, mm. personally. Because one more one is nowhere in history that black people can <laughs> <laughs> go themselves <laughs> in the past. Um, and two, I don't want to go back in time and try to change anything. Mm. Because we, what we what we go through now is is, is because it's it's th things are getting better or things are just getting you know we need where I'm at now is for the love of God it's because of mistakes I made in the past, but. Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, not the only ones that are my favorite movies. I love Do the Right Thing. Do the Right Thing is my favorite movie of all time. That's the movie that told me, uh, that formed me, what I want to do in my life. Malcolm X, mm. amazing movie as well. Um, and some of the more recent, you know, recent movies that I love are. Um, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah. And have you ever yeah. seen little kids watch that movie? Like, it's one thing to watch it as an adult, but I just, I love that movie because of just the diversity and just yeah. in Brooklyn. Like, I don't, I don't know if people really understand that like diversity really starts with kids. Like that, that's really mm -hmm. how the next generation and you change the narrative. You got all these adults that's over here trying to change these these individuals that are already fully formed. But I, I you know, I work with kids and I've, I mean, I've seen how like, just seeing a, a 
cartoon movie like that. It's just, it's not a big deal that all your friends are black or you're in Brooklyn and you're doing X, Y, and Z or you like this type of music. It's just, it's, it's part of their culture. It's not even a big deal. It's not like they're looking mm -hmm. at it and gawking at it. I love that movie. Sorry. Yeah, I love it. I love yeah. that too. It, and, you know, I, um, it's so interesting because the visuals, I'm a, I, I love really cool. I'm really in, it's kind of like my thing. Um, I'm into like comic books and really cool visuals. Mm -hmm. And I love, um, particularly, I love horror comic books, which is kind of like, um, everybody likes the super, you know, um, superhero comic books, but um, there's a, um, there's a, a a company out in New York. They make these horror hard. Um, they're the the Gentiles. They're I call them the, the Gentiles. They make these horror comic books that have like the visuals very similar to what you see in um, into the into the Spider Verse. And so it kind of reminded me of that. It has like a really authentic comic book feel to it. You know, I'm waiting for that comic book horror to come out, whatever that may be, the big comic book mm -hmm. horror, that might be something I do. I don't know. I'm putting it out there, guys. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but, I, you know, I'm into, I'm into the comic book horrors. I had to put that That's out there. Dope. The visuals. The visuals. So we are, guys, we are getting very close to the end of our podcast. So yeah. I want to... Oh, this is a question, Bestie. You ask it all the time, so I'm not even going to. Oh, yeah. Gonna so, uh, yes. Okay. So, um, we've been asking everybody um, what is your mantra for getting, bless you, bless you. <laughs> Bestie's not feeling well today, guys, but she's still on here like the goat. A uh, professional her thing. You would have never even knew that she was under the weather. So hand uh -huh. clap for her. That's all I got to say. That's Thank you. Best friend, <laughs> boss. Um, anyway, so uh, Stefan, what is your mantra for getting your mindset right and staying motivated? It like it's kind of like your life an life anthem. It could be like a song. You know. You know, like. For my sister, she always sings, which is kind of sad, but ooh, child, things are gonna get easier. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Or like, you know, I just had to get it how I live. Hey, I was a dead friend. Like, well, it's, it's, it's something, or it could be a song, it could be just something you say, a mantra. Like, what's your life, life anthem for Sam Love Jesus <laughs> is the reason for the season. There you go. <laughs> he is the reason for the season. <laughs> no, okay, I was in a play and we had a whole like song. <laughs> but no, I, I was I would say this to um everybody because I'm not I'm a Christian. Everybody is a Christian. Some are, are, are Muslims, Jewish. Um, you know, so I would say this to just if even even if you're atheist. I'll say this. There's, there's a higher power out there. Tap into it. There's a higher power. Mm, there Believe you go. Amen. Amen. That's, that, that's, that's, that's just me. I'm not trying to push a religious agenda because we all believe in different things, but at the end of the day, all these different things point to one source. Mm, come on. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. Lord. And praise the Lord that we have a new <laughs> president. Amen. Because last week, we didn't know what was going down. We was with Barbara Barna Abel. You can check that episode out. Legendary casting director. Uh, but now we have something to rejoice and be glad in because God is good and invited. I'm ready for a change. That's right. Is president so Trump will still be president for the next four years. Let me stop. I'm joking, y'all. I'm joking. <laughs> I can't. I can't deal with. I That's can't not deal with it. That's not funny. Not funny. Oh, everyone, I also want to something. I will go ahead. No, go ahead, Mr. Ron. I'm, and I'm just saying that I'm glad a clown is at the office. But go ahead. Yeah. Yes, we are. We all should be glad, but half of the country is not. So therefore, we all aren't. So there. I'm just gonna stop the count. Stop the count. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I know. I know. 
Okay, so also, guys, I want to put out there um, on November 23rd, you can join me live on Instagram at 8 p.m. for my new book, Ooh. The Artist Manure. It's a book launch, so follow me at Get It Girl Tish. Mm -hmm. Uh, on Instagram, November 23rd, um, I will be talking to you guys about what we're talking about here is being opportunity ready, creating your own opportunities, going for it, getting it done. Things that, guys, if you've been watching this show, you should already know, but I'm going to give you some tangible resources and tools in writing in this book that you can use to get to the next step, to get unstuck. Okay, <laughs> so to define yourself, so you got somewhere to go and you ain't just sitting there being like, my life sucks because I'm an artist. <laughs> no, we ain't having that. We ain't having that. Or my life sucks because I'm an entrepreneur. We ain't having that because there's things that you can do. So we won't talk about that at my launch party, um, November 23rd at 8 p.m. It's going to be on Instagram live so mm -hmm. Ooh, yes. and you can follow stefan at it's underneath at stefan bristol on instagram yeah. Facebook, twitter all the above also tune in next week as we talk to um celebrity hair stylist jennifer mcdougall and i mean qvc host media host i mean she's pretty spectacular. So uh, tune in next week uh, as we talk to Jennifer about uh, how to be on camera ready and uh, especially during this virtual era. So uh, yeah. And thank you so much for coming on the show, Stefan. We're just, uh, I know that, um, I know that all the advice that you gave people that it will really be instrumental. So thank you so much. Can we give them a clap, Bestie? Can we give them a clap? Oh, uh, didn't want to encore. Da, 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 da. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, we're not going to work on here, but all right, we ain't going to go there. We're not ready. We're gonna keep it PG for the audience, bestie. Got to keep it PG. Today. We got to keep it PG. Which one for the sponsors? Oh, that's you, oh, you, never, you, hold on. <laughs> never mind. Are you, how are you keeping motherfucking PG on in here? Oh. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I mean, honestly, I feel like I'm super PG. You know, people come on here and they just get, they let loose. They don't care. They're just themselves. Yeah. That, you know. that don't mean that doesn't mean that we can't. We are going to come. We are going to compose. Our, we're going to Michelle Obama. it. <laughs> Michelle Obama gets clatched. Is she like. She does. <laughs> so like I just see Michelle and Barack be like this. <laughs> so please. <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna I keep it. not there. We're gonna keep it. Yeah, we ain't there yet. All Thanks, right. Guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Evan, again. Thank you, ladies. Be Thank safe. you guys. We'll see you next week, guys. Wear a mask. Yes. Oh, yeah, wear a mask. Wear a mask. Oh, Stefan, stay on after so we can um talk and thank okay. you. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 Yeah.